Hi, kitty cats. I am Amethyst Herrick, your hostess for Gender Identity Weekly, a weekly discussion about identity and gender from the contributors and guests of the Purple Pop Publications website, Gender Identity Today. This content and our guest today is brought to you by subscribers of Gender Identity Today. If you're already a subscriber, first of all, thank you so much for your ongoing support because subscribers not only always receive new content directly to their email inbox as soon as it publishes, but they're also able to interact with every contributor directly, including me. And like, I want to talk to me, so, so it must be good. If you would like to support shows just like this one, as well as other podcasts, other videos, and all the written articles by our contributors, please consider subscribing using the links you're going to find in the show notes. Well, today it is my distinct pleasure to be speaking with Dr. Lino Martinez. Hi, Lino. Hello. <laughs> so nice to be here. I know. It's been, what, only three weeks, I think, since we spoke. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> Or a little more, maybe. But um, Lino is an author of a great book, a podcaster. This is how we met. Also a poet, which, by the way, I'm still reeling from the poem you wrote for me in real time. Uh He's also a singer and a professor of psychology. So, you have, so it's a it's a psy D. So it's a uh, how does that translate out? Because that's doctor Psy-D, of psychology. Uh, yes, Y D is doctor in psychology. Okay, thank you. Lino is also the host of of the podcast called A Little Less Fear, and that was how uh, Lino and I met. But before we started talking, um, you told me this story before. You were telling me part of your story and why you started podcasting and it was one of the most stunning like displays i i hate using the word resiliency because it sounds so it's a bit cliched sounding now but um it was this great story and i knew i wanted to talk to you about you know the tenacity that you've displayed and just this ridiculous positivity not ridiculous (laughs) like a ridiculous amount this is just people go how do you get that positive oh my goodness and i've heard it before i've heard that before (laughs) <laughs> hopefully that hopefully that didn't sound so left-handed as when I just did it but not at all. <laughs> I mean it is a compliment thank you so let's go way back way way back to the beginning yeah when you came into this world uh-huh. you know you had mentioned you had a, a rare genetic disease and and that's I mean that's not something that you develop that's something you're given it's a metaphysically given disease so, so you came into this world, you know, some people would say genetically disadvantaged. Mm-hmm. Can you describe what that, what the, uh, the effects of that genetic disease are? I can definitely, definitely describe the effects of the genetic disease. Uh, but one thing I want to point out before is the word that you use metaphysics, metaphysically born into it. And which is true to me because I'm a very spiritual person. Metaphysically mm-hmm. being metaphysics, being the study of the nature of reality. What is reality? And in this case, it's a, for me, it's been more of a spiritual experience. Uh, the disease was given to me, but the way that I see it now that I'm on the other side thriving is that I chose the disease prior to being uh, incarnated into this body. Right, right. But had you asked me this four years ago when I wrote my book, I would have had a totally different answer. So well, let's start with before knowing the spiritual element. So before knowing the spiritual element, the disease was given to me as how I mm-hmm. did feel it was and that I didn't have a choice rather other than to go through the disease and roll with the punches as they, as they stemmed from birth. And so uh, the disease is called Muckle-Well syndrome. It is statistically one in a million in the United mm. States and statistically one in every 500,000 in Europe, in Europe because it's most common in the European descent. Oh, and so, yeah, it's really interesting. And so the disease can have either a mutation, the, gen- the gene and LRP3 can have a mutation, or it can switch on and off like a satellite. In my case, it's not a mutation. It's more of a satellite. It turns on and it turns I off. See. And so in my case, I'm pretty certain and so are my geneticists that it was turned on at birth. So I was a breech baby with the cord wrapped around my neck. What Oof. was going on in January 1980, which is 
you know, finishing the 70s, like brand new year, 80. I don't know what was going on. I don't know what pediatrics was was like back then. I don't know if I was even breathing. All I know is that it was an emergency C-section. I was a little, a little over a month and a half early. And oh I lived in an incubator for about two weeks. And so that's how my life began. My life began living in incubators with the lack of mother love, with the lack of human touch. And my right. love at the time that was given to me were nurses and doctors. And yeah. so that was my first human touch. Nurses, doctors, IVs, and a little a little tank to keep me warm. <laughs> like a baby yeah. chick, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, although actually somewhat, somewhat weaker because baby chicks at least, you know, develop more quickly, I guess. They do. And they're a little more know. independent in, in that case. Yeah. Human yeah. babies are not independent compared to other animals and, right. and uh, mammals. Yeah. <laughs> Did did you you know you you brought that up in particular that you didn't get mother love from from birth essentially mm -hmm. right. what uh, what do you feel is the effect of that I, I'm honestly curious I I don't know the effect of that coming from me four years ago again having a spiritual inclination and realization of why I went through everything that I went through but if you ask me this when I was still in a lot of mental suffering. I can mm -hmm. tell you that the implications of not having a mother's breast milk or a mother's love or mother's touch right from birth for the first whatever it was, two weeks, um, two, three weeks, four weeks of life, I feel there was a disconnection. But there had been a disconnection throughout my life uh, mm -hmm. with my mother. So, But it began then. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wonder if... Um... I'm going off on a major tangent here, but our our son also, um, he was born with with uh, gosh jaundice. I guess I think it's called. Yeah, jaundice is yellowing and, of the skin, the liver. Is, yes, yes, that was it. Mm -hmm. And uh, he he stayed for two or three days, I think, in a you know with a in an incubator type yeah. thing with a, a blue light, I believe. And um, mm -hmm. you know, I wonder what the effect of his uh, on him was. <laughs> wonder what the effect. Uh, on them was so it, well we um, also can't generalize because this was my experiences i mean it would be somebody else's experience or somebody else's interpretation of what they may have point. gone through yeah no it's an excellent point it's an excellent point so i know that um that muckle wells uh, syndrome that yes. i looked up because i know extremely little about it but uh -huh. i know that there that uh one of the one of the symptoms is a senso uh, sensory neural deafness actually yes you had mentioned some something about for you know for those of you who didn't go through medical school like say me mm -hmm. sensory neural deafness uh actually means um like the 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 um the eardrum and stuff it doesn't work right i mean like it's it's not that there's damage it's that it started off or it's it, it, it loses its ability to to sense right Actually, sensory neural hearing loss. So there's two different types of hearing loss. So sensory neural okay. hearing loss in this case are the neurons not making the proper connection. There's some type of damage done to the nerves that that okay. are that connect the messages that go from whatever you hear audibly into your brain. And so okay. the type of the most common type of hearing loss that people are like, I can't hear. So I got to get a hearing loss to where I can I can get a hearing aid where I can hear better. My hearing aids, which I love my my hearing aids are incredible. They're tiny, skinny, little. Yeah. But mine is to be able to uh, give me some clarity and it does amplify sound, but it gives me clarifying um, some clarification for me to be able to understand words. So, for example, if I don't wear the hearing aid. Um, there is some permanent damage, and so that's why I keep this one. Um, but it's gotten better. It's uh, my hearing has actually gotten better through the, through the last four years. But the way this type of hearing loss uh, works or manifests is that words don't make sense, or I don't understand a word. For example, when I'm teaching my oh. students, a student can say, "Hey, Dr. Martinez, what's on chapter four? And this happened a couple semesters ago, where I was like, "Chocolate four." They're like chapter, and I just couldn't. My my, I could not understand the word chapter. It doesn't make sense. It does. Yeah. I don't hear chapter. I can hear a word, 
but it doesn't translate to what it sounds like. I can look, I can even I look see. at your your lips, but it doesn't sound like it. And then, then every, the students are yelling, chapter! And I'm like, chocolate? And they're like, C-H? I'm like, A? I'm like, oh, chapter! Okay, I got it, got it. So, I mean, it's just these words, they just kind of just don't, it's like the brain doesn't understand yeah. what's coming in. Oh, that's crazy. Thank you yeah. for the clarification, by the way. I, I yeah. you know, like I said, I didn't go to medical school. Yeah, that's okay. No which worries. Is, which is good. <laughs> Thank you for the clarification. But that, I, so I mean, how did this, how did this affect your childhood? Okay. So it, actually it my took hearing a while. was excellent. My but, hearing was excellent. It's very, very common for people with muckle well syndrome for one of the first things to go is their hearing. And almost always mm-hmm. a lot of them go completely deaf. Uh, deafness runs my father. His he doesn't pass a hearing test, and he and by the way, I genetically, <laughs> I got this disease from my father. It's on my father's side. He's the carrier. He's dead. And yeah. so um, he's the, he has a so much hearing loss, but he refuses to wear hearing aids. Now that's a tangent, but anyways, uh, <laughs> that's a whole other world. It's a whole other tangent. And so the, I actually didn't experience hearing loss till much later. I was maybe about 35 years old when the hearing loss started to present itself. But there's other things that manifested with the disease. What it, they're, basically what the disease does, and one of my doctors explained it really funny, saying that it's a drama queen. So the drama queen meaning that if ever the body feels, when if the disease is activated or if there's a mutation, it will feel threatened by almost anything. And that's mm. what makes it a drama queen. It's like, oh my goodness, there's a new flower in the house. Well, I don't know if I'm allergic to it yet, but it's new and it might be a threat. So you're going to be allergic. I see. And not yeah. only are you allergic, you're sneezing, you're getting hives, you're getting angioedema, your eyes are closed shut, you're going to the ER, you can't breathe, you need an EpiPen. It's like everything is a threat. And when the body is constantly in threat, it starts to affect all of your organs. Everything mm-hmm. gets affected, every single organ. And when your body is in flight and fight, everything gets affected. And in yeah. this case, what got affected was because of continuous threat were my peripheral nerves and my motor neurons. And people that are, for people that are not aware what these uh, motor neurons do and peripheral nerves, they do everything from control your digestion, your heart rate, your breathing, your growth, your sleeping, your vision, your speech, your, 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 your ability to go pee, everything, everything it controls. And so because I went so many years without being diagnosed, since it was such a rare disease, uh, by the time I was 36, which is when I was diagnosed, I had already had close to 50 surgeries by then. So I graduated with my doctor back in 2010 when I was 30 years old. And two years prior to that, when I was 28, so from 28 years old to about 40, 40, I had close to 50 surgeries, and it was all to oh, save my life and to maintain a, a healthy life. So it was maintenance. Yeah. A lot of them were maintenance surgeries. But one of the biggest things that, that my body lost its ability to do naturally is pee. So my pelvic muscles had completely, they had paralyzed, and they had become oh, stiff and tight. And with and just like nerves and, and uh, neurons and muscles, if you don't use it, you lose it. So because things became stiff, I wasn't using it. The bladder acquired something called interstitial cystitis, which is a hardening of the bladder mucosa, the lining, the inner lining of the bladder. And it became so hardened that it shrunk down to holding only four ounces of liquid. Oh gosh. So I was faced with all kinds of challenges. What do we do with someone with such a rare genetic disease at such a young age whose bladder is capacity is four ounces? So I went through a series of operations, major operations, to try to save that native bladder. But at the end, they weren't able to. So at 33 years old, I had what's called a radical cystectomy, which is a complete reconstruction, reconstructive operation of my urinary tract system. In which they completely removed the the urinary native bladder. They completely removed my urethra. For those that don't know what the urethra is, it's the hole that that urine comes out of. That was removed. They removed my appendix in order to make what's called a conduit. A conduit is a little hole of where I stick now a catheter Mm. to to, um, expel my urine. And it's in my abdomen. And they used about 60 inches of my small bowel intestine. They opened up my abdominal, abdominal cavity and they, they made a reservoir. 
they re they cut my ureters, which are the tubes to the kidneys, and yeah. they shortened them a bit, connected all together like plumbing. And after that 13 and a half hour surgery, uh, close to a month in the hospital, um, three blood transfusions. It uh, and I had a feeding tube too, by the way, for eight years. But I'll get into oh, that. I'll get into Wait, that part what? in a moment. Yeah, for eight years. Okay, eight no, years. It was just this. removed last year, actually, last February. Holy cats! Oh my so, gosh. Okay. Yeah, that surgery in itself took five years to heal. Why five years to heal? Because of repairs, because of infections, because of hospital stays. Sure. And so I, I was, and I would be nauseous and sick to my stomach every time I'd stick a catheter into pee. I was oh, like, oh gosh. gosh. So it was a lot of getting used to my new body. What is it like? And I went through a lot of loss. It wasn't just the disease I had to go through. I had to go through loss. There was grief, yes. moments of grief, a lot of crying, a lot of isolation. I'm not a normal person. I can never pee like, oh, it must be nice. You can go to a, a restaurant and, and, and choose any restroom you want. Oh, it must be nice. You can pee. There's a lot of anger and a lot of pain that I had to go through um, mm -hmm. in between all of this loss that my body was experiencing. So um, the next thing to go after that, I say go because I, I had to let it go. And okay, fine. I accept it. And I now have a new way to pee. And at the time, it was called a disability, but now I call it an ability because I've got an incredible ability that other people don't have. And in that is adaptability, in which I find, yes. which I, I think it's freaking awesome that I'm able to survive the way that I have been. But aside from that, as the disease progressed, it started going to my vocal cords, and I had vocal cord paralysis for two and a half years, oh, in which I thought, you know what? I have to learn sign language. I didn't go to all this schooling, and I don't have all this ambition still inside me for me to not communicate. So luckily, my father helped me out financially. He took me to sign school here. I'll pay for it. Thanks, Dad. I learned mm -hmm. sign language. I'm still like at first grade level at this to this day, but I had to learn how to continue. And continue was I, I need to learn how to speak a different way. I need to learn how to feel a different way. I need yeah. to learn how to adapt a different way and how to love a different way because I only I only know what what's common and what's common is hearing and speaking what is left of me if I can't hear if I can't right. speak if I can't eat and if I can't pee right and throughout this well somewhere in the middle you were telling me of all of this I mean I, don't, I would almost call it like a rebirth you had to re relearn everything that that yeah. was Lino essentially yeah. And in the middle of this, gender dysphoria ends up, I mean, it's uh, presumably the dysphoria had been present from, from an earlier age, or, or was, that, was that more of a, it wasn't a rapid onset gender dysphoria, <laughs> whatever turfs are out there, and just, okay, just telling you. I love that rapid onset gender dysphoria. <laughs> Such a... Oh my goodness! We, yeah, we could probably talk for the next hour about that one, but yeah. we, to, to, I mean, because some, because ultimately you ended up transitioning gender, and I would expect that that in having to relearn all of your identity, or at least to to redirect um, who you were and how you were going to express it, I would imagine that made it completely easy. That just went okay. Well, I mean, you know what? I already know who I am. I'd better transition gender as well. You know what? Um, one could say I know who I am, but you really don't know who you are until you are, until you become. And in becoming, okay. and you learn to be, that's when you are. I, I, At the I time, I that, wasn't. Yeah. I was in the process of, I only knew what I felt. Oh, I see. And so I, I often told my parents, mostly my mother, my father was working a lot, that I didn't want to wear dresses growing up. Yeah, I didn't yeah. want to be in pigtails. I didn't want to do any of this. I would fight her. I would cry even. But she didn't understand. I mean, we, she grew up Latina, Latina household. You have a daughter, you're going you're gonna to be a girl. Sure. She grew up cooking and cleaning. Well, these are some of the roles I got to take. You know, I remember I even have some pictures of some of my toys that I got back in like 1982, 83. They're mops and they're, they're, they're yeah. Wow. <laughs> a mop, a broom, you know? I mean, oh, wow. hey. <laughs> Start those gender roles now. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Two years old? Yeah, why not? Let's yeah, make right. sure that you feel like hell forever yeah. your entire life. And so, I mean, it was a continuous struggle fighting with 
with my mother is that I'm going to say because it was really a fight that I had with her um, constantly. I remember even being 28 years old and in my closet because uh, I started my transition at 34 or long past okay. after having my doctorate. So Okay, got, I was going to ask. Okay. Yeah, and so in my closet I had – Half of my former birth name was Carolina. She was a badass. Excuse me, I'm going to say this. Can I cuss on your show? Of course. I was a badass oh, bitch. Yeah. I'm going to say yeah. she was a badass. And she was hot, too. She was a sexy bitch. So anyway. <laughs> I bet. Looking oh, at you shit. now, I can imagine. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, man. I, I chuckles every time I think that. But, it, but anyways, she had <laughs> no, her right? female clothes. And then I had... And then I say I because Hidden Lino had his, mm-hmm. his side over here. And so I'm going to see mom and dad and family members. If I'm going to a party or whatever, my mom would, would, would drill me or grill me. Right. We're going to go see this family member. You better look good. And I know what yeah. she meant. She yeah. meant you better wear lipstick and you better look like a girl. And so I was like, fuck, you know, even at 28, you know, I was like, hang on, I'm, I'm graduating to be a doctor and I'm still being controlled by this. What's wrong with right. me? Right. But, but I was. I was. And so I, I, I would give in to it. I'm about to see family members put on the lipstick, put on the heels, and, you know, just play the role. Just here it is. Play the role. I'll play it well. You know, so, right. and I played it well. And so, um, but as time went by, Amy, and I started to live in hospitals, and I started to be alone and live alone in the hospitals, I didn't watch TV. I did a lot of reading. I never watched TV in the yeah. 10 years that I lived in hospitals, me and my mind. And I was going through this existential crisis. What is the meaning of my life? What is my purpose? Sure. What am I doing here? I'm dying. Why? For reals, why did I go through all that schooling, all that passion for education, all that straight A student? Since I was a little kid, straight A's, I'm a straight A student. I didn't go through all of that for nothing. There's more to my life than this. And while I was living in hospitals, um, it was... Caitlyn Jenner, that that transition. I remember reading about yeah. her, and I was like, "Hang yes. on a minute, Caitlyn Jenner. Wow, well, she's in her sixties and she's transitioning." Because I kept saying, "You know, I'll never transition in this life as long as my parents live." That was my answer. As long as my mom and my dad and my brother are alive, I'm not going to yeah. transition because it's going to affect them. It's going to make them uncomfortable, and they only love Carolina. That that's what that was my mentality. And then mm-hmm. when I started to live and be by myself in hospitals, I thought, "Hang on a minute, I might die." If I have a feeding tube, I can't even eat like a normal person. I can't even piss yeah. like a normal person. My heart rate is 150 beats without all these high doses of medication. I can have a heart oh, attack. Shoot. I yeah. I mean, I can't speak. I can't hear. Who am I living for? At that moment, I realized it was life or death for me. You know what? Caitlyn Jenner inspired me. I don't know much about her. I know there's a lot of politics involved. I'm not a fan. I don't know anything else other than uh, I'm not a fan, and I don't know anything other than that she transitioned at a later age. And at yes. the time, I remember thinking, you know what? If she can do it, why can't I? And I'm, and, right. and she's got a bunch of kids. As a man, had a bunch of kids. She's yeah. got to face all her kids. I'm going to have to face my family. But at the moment, I'm doing this for me. And so when I decided to do it for me, I didn't tell anybody. I didn't make, I didn't, I wasn't a parade about it. I wasn't like, duh, 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 guess what, everybody I'm about to transition and I'm about to get on hormones. You know, I was like, <laughs> hang on a minute. I, I made the decision to say okay to my health. It's, you're going to take my bladder out. We don't know what the survival rate is. I made that decision. Take my yeah. bladder out. This is my body. It's my body to get on hormones and to become the authentic person that I always knew I want. It's my decision. I'm going to do it. It's my responsibility to be authentic and to love myself. And so yes. in that is when I, when I decided to take hormones. And it wasn't until about a year later that I started telling family members, I'm about to transition. I'm going to transition. But I didn't tell them I already had started hormones because I knew it was going to be oh, a slow okay. process. Yeah. Yeah. Well, of course. I mean, it's extremely slow. But yeah. <laughs> I'm super curious, though, because like I've read, I mean, were you reading like the regular existentialist authors? Because I mean... I've read, you know, Jean-Paul Sartre, Albert, Albert Camus. Apparently, yeah, I can't say the name. Frederick Nietzsche, <laughs> all the philosophers. Right. Yeah. Well the, well, the greatest one was Viktor Frankl, and I must have read his book okay. three times. A Man's Search oh, for wait. Meaning, Viktor Frankl. Yeah. Oh, so he's considered an existential psychologist. He is, yes. I didn't know. Okay, okay, okay. 
in Victor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Man's Search for Meaning, he yeah. was a Holocaust survivor. So he went through the Nazi camps. And I mean, if anyone's gonna have something good to say, what? It, how do you survive? How do you find the meaning of life when you're yeah. seeing hundreds of thousands of millions of people of your own culture, your own blood, your ancestors, your relatives being murdered, and right. you might be next? Right. How do you right. find meaning in, uh, to life in that? So it was this book that I read about three times, and that really made me feel like you know what i'm he was a soldier a soldier of life soldier of to exist and in this case i'm also a soldier a soldier to to keep going here oh gosh that's a great way of saying that because i mean you know victor frankl's much much of the story that that he tells in that in in that book is you know there were there were nazi you know there were nazi soldiers i guess guards i guess they would be considered <clears throat> Who are saying, okay, pick up these rocks and move them from one side of the yard to the other. Okay, now pick them back up and move them to the other side for the sake of destroying this, this sense of meaning. Because you're doing something that is completely meaningless and makes you feel meaningless. So... I so not sorry, I didn't mean to, to bring the house down there. I will no. <laughs> say, I mean, would, would Victor Frankl discovered or at least the big message i pulled out of that book he has that one line in it I, and I'm, I'm gonna murder it i'm sure i'm that's I, fine my quotes are always terrible but where he, he says between between action and reaction i think he says there's always a choice yeah. yes i guess the closest okay something like that but but i guess that choice so what was the choice you made you, you just said okay that's it i'm living that's it. I'm living. And at the time, I had been seeing the same psychiatrist for about 12 years. Okay. I'd seen the same psychologist at the time for about 10 years. And they all knew my story. There, I didn't have to go through the whole, let, you have to see a therapist for two years to, you know, the, all the, the rules and right. regulations that, that yes. trans patients need to go through here in California. And so they're like, yeah, yeah. we'll write you off. We know you, We know who you are. And so I, you know, I started with the with the uh, with hormone replacement therapy, and uh, it, it's it's been amazing. But you know, also, and I know, in having you in my podcast, we had talked about uh, different types of the intersex and thing about twelve hundred different mm -hmm. yes. the genotypes that constitute someone for intersex. So I was also tested uh, twenty one hydroxylase deficient twice. Okay, and in it's a steroid hormone. So in a normal person's body that or a normal female normal male they're going to have some normal balance of steroid hormones and in this case it was absent and if it was absent meaning i was deficient of 21 hydroxylase i was 21 hydroxylase deficient that shows that there is an intersex not in the gonads but in the in the uh in the chemical makeup itself yeah the system itself yeah. In the, the endocrine system. That, that's exactly. interesting. Yes, in the endocrine system. <laughs> so, so I know what it felt like my first couple of weeks when I put that first estrogen patch on. <laughs> what, what, did it, what did it feel? I mean, obviously, you didn't put an estrogen patch on. What did it feel when you got those, those first testosterone injections or however it was? So I didn't get injections till about five years after my transition. The first five years was uh, testosterone gel that yeah, I would gel, put okay. on my shoulders. Yeah. And it was great because that was the one thing I had to look forward to. I was like, okay, here I am dying right. in the hospital, but at least I'm becoming my true self. Yes. And oh at least gosh. if I die, it's going to be in the right body. Yes. Those were my thoughts though, Amy. I'll tell you, it's always yes. been the right body. I'll tell you that much. But at I, the time, yeah. that, that was my thought process. Sorry, I'm misting up a bit here. I I had yeah I had that same thought that it was like you know even if even if my, the rest of my life feels like hell at least you know my hormonal balance will be correct that I I will feel I will feel like myself and and uh, it's always so uh, it's always so amazing to hear somebody you know to say that Whew, hang on do you want to take a break you should go get a cigarette or something but <laughs> so. So I, I know, so the, the gender transition occurred after, after graduate school, right? Oh yeah. It you was, said... uh, I began four years after doctoral okay. school. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. To, okay. Thank you. Cause, cause I mean, your, 
your dissertation included it was existential it was existential I'm going to, how am I screwing this up? Existentialist psychology. I mean, it was, was an aspect of it, right? Your, your dissertation yes, research? So the dissertation, um, for those tuning in for the first time to complete a doctorate degree, one needs to complete a dissertation, which is a type of book study. It's in the process of the book. It gets hardbound. And uh, to study, it's either quantitative or qualitative, depending on the type of research methodology that you choose. And then you defend it. And um, almost always, a lot of the times when students choose their topic, it's personal. And they recommend that it's personal. That way you give it a lot yeah. more in depth right. and a lot more of your heart. And so yes. the topic at the time was uh, using existential psychology to treat depressed women suffering from chronic urological disorders. Gosh. Which is what, what I was going through. P pretty dang personal, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it sure was. So, so I've misunderstood, I think, much of what existed, existential psychology... How am I stumbling over this? That's okay. I've, talk, I've said some pretty big words, and I'm not... <laughs> anyway, I think I've misunderstood much of the, the, the thrust of existential psychology then, because it is... Is the intent to say, what's my reason for living? And then coming up with it and, and living it? So the whole thing about existential psychology is that when somebody faces the question of why am I here? What is my meaning in life? Why do I exist? Essentially, one can become anxious by feeling alone. I'm sure. alone in this world in this case. What is the meaning to my life? Right. And in, in, in ridding these anxieties in a way of understanding oneself, one's surrounding through society, interpersonally, um, connecting with others, and just really finding this foundation of your existence and what your own personal meaning is. I mean, a lot of it's really philosophical. And so I find that if somebody can find their meaning and their own personal reason for living or for even existing, it really helps to navigate the feelings of down, the feelings of feeling mm -hmm. down, depression, anxieties. And it gives you a, another day to wake up to and hopefully with more of a smile or a grin or a smirk rather than a frown. And right. so, um, yeah, I really, I really love that. I, one, at the time, that was my journey because I was asking myself, what is my what's my purpose for, for, for living? By the way, I wrote a poem about this, um, dedicated for us. I always do oh, this, you know, for this, for this topic. <laughs> yeah. So I'll, I'll, um, I'll read it at the very end, but that's okay. essentially, that's existential philosophy. It's existential psychology, um, and existential psychotherapy. Yeah. Okay. All right. Cause my introduction to existentialism was, you know, as I mentioned, Jean-Paul Sartre, you know, Albert Camus, um, Franz Kafka was another one. And these were not pick-me-up kind of books. You mm -hmm. know, The Stranger, The Metamorphosis, not... Ultimately, they're the result that the, that the characters came to, they're the conclusion the characters came to, is that there was no meaning to life. I mean, especially in The Stranger, you know, guys are pulling a trigger saying, what's the diff? That is the extreme, and that is definitely the philosophical view, and that is something that Friedrich Nietzsche said. I mean, his quote was, right. God is dead. I yes, mean, right. <laughs> right. But and if we no don't cares, go from yeah. one extreme to the other, how will we find our common ground? And we kind of need that ex those extremes that ebb and flow in order for us to really find our own identity. And in questioning this, there was a time that I felt God didn't exist. There was a time in my life where right. I felt I had no identity. And in, 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 and in all, there really is no identity because we're all one single consciousness and we're all love consciousness. But at the time when I'm trying to find yourself and your own divine light, these are the questions that I specifically went through to find who I am today. Yeah. Can I ask the question then? You can ask your... anything you'd like. <laughs> That's, so I'll ask the question and you'll go, nah, I'm not going to answer it. I'll answer Damn, anything, you said... really. <laughs> so, what's your, so what's your meaning? Thank you for that. Well, you know, I was going to wait to the end, but that's actually the poem. It's called The Meaning to Life. So I'll just read it now. Okay. 
<laughs> right. Do it. The meaning to life. The meaning to life. My meaning to life is a given. It's a push and pull. And at the same time, it's an integration, a collaboration, a dance with the ebb and flow of nature. My meaning to life is here and now. It's present in front of you, sharing a breath of air, filling each other's lungs with laughter, smiling at each other, filling our hearts with joy. The meaning to life is a hug, a handshake, a tear, and a sigh. The meaning to my life exists because you care. You care to know. And so love grows because only love truly knows. My meaning to life is my meaning to love. And in this, I thrive. Yeah. Thank you for that question. <laughs> I was oh ready gosh. for you. <laughs> well, I see that. I expected you to go, nah, it's personal. Oh. <laughs> but that's, so, so your meaning is, is to love, to express the love and to spread the love sounds kind of, you know, crazy, but not at all. You got it right on. Nothing with the word love in a sentence is ever crazy or absurd crazy. or weird or anything other than what love is. Love is love. And you can't, it's, it's just impossible to put any negative word in front of love or any resistance to love <laughs> because pure love has no resistance. And so my meaning to life and my meaning in this life and my meaning right now at this present moment in front of you is to love and to be receiving your energy is receiving your love. Mm. And I'm giving you my love back. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Now, Thank you. I'm giving you my love back. I love that. It's, Thank you. And I receive it. Well, it's stunning. I mean, because, you know, I, want, I wanted to start off speaking with you saying, you know, what, what were all the things that brought you down? So that I could say, now tell me all the things that bring you up. You know, <laughs> why are you still here? And that's it. Uh-huh. So... So, but keep going. I mean, you you had more of an answer. Sure. So keep going with um, with what? <laughs> I mean, why are, why are you still here? I mean, what's what was the? Oh no, I know what I was. I know how I want to ask this because you said four years ago there was a change. What was the light switch that flipped there? What what changed? That's such a good question. What changed? Because I can't think of any specific moment where there was like this catalytic eclipse mm -hmm. or a catalytic explosion at that given moment where I said, from now on, this has changed. It's been a series of steps. It's been a series of moments. It's been a series of 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 solitude, of of laughter, of sharing, of caring. But for the most part, the process that it took for me was self love. And yeah. it, it was really tuning in to who I am as an energetic being. I became a practicing devout Buddhist for three years. I took classes three times a week. And wow. I even thought I was going to be a monk at one point. I was like, maybe I'm going to be a monk because of how passionate I was about it. And in this is where I found inner joy and inner peace. And I began meditating. And in this meditations that I had, the, I started to get close to myself and closer to God, which is the eternal consciousness. And Buddhists don't talk about God. God, my feeling of God or eternal consciousness started come when I stopped practicing Buddhist, Buddhism as much as I did because I started to go even deeper inward and, and uh, practice other means of spirituality. But at the time, I realized, you know, what's one thing that's, that, that's always been true to me, tr true for me, and true to my personality? And it's always been joyful regardless since I was a kid. I mean, my mom can tell people I was a, I was a good kid. I was a, a sweet little kid, always giving, always loving. And, and, I, and that always resonated with me. And I was like, you know what? I, I love to love, and I love to receive love, but I, I didn't love to receive love wholeheartedly at the time. Mm -hmm. And sure. so I would give a lot. I was a giver. I was a people pleaser. And little did I know at the time that overly giving and being a people pleaser is a trauma response. It comes oh. from not getting your needs met. And mm. so at the time, I thought, okay, hang on a minute. I really had to do a lot of what people call shadow work. Yeah. Going back at the traumas, releasing a lot of traumas, not identifying with traumas, not identifying with any of that because our traumas are not who we are. 
we right. keep that a lot of people hold these and they they start identifying with the things that went bad for them and went wrong for them we're not the bad things that went for us that's not who we are as a person because at the very end if you strip us of our body and we're left with just our energy are we still that trauma is yeah, are we still that question. trauma yeah in that human experience and so in going in deep and and going in and and um really trying to understand this these shadows and releasing them a lot of release a lot of release and a lot of release and forgiveness forgiveness was huge i had to forgive other people and when i when when i found it hard to forgive other people i then started to go even deeper and i was like hang on a minute maybe the one that needs forgiving is myself and when you start to forgive yourself hang on i didn't do anything wrong i forgive myself for not knowing because you only do as much as you do because that's how much you know to that point right. at that point you don't know anything sure. else you really can't beat yourself down for not knowing and so in this forgiving myself i was then able to let go of so much pain and that's where real inner healing that's where the wellness journey began and the wellness journey then leveled up to self-love. How can I love myself more? Well, you know what? I can love everything that I went through in life. I can love all the scars on my body. I can love the scars on my chest. I can love the feeding tube that I had. I can love my new neobladder. I can love my stature. I can love this new voice. I can love it all. And in this loving myself, I started to love others and, and have less judgment. If you're able to love your body and your scars, how can you judge others in that case? You can't. Right. I love right. myself, so I love you the way that you are. And in that was the mirror of love. And the mirror of love is really the direction that I'm always heading towards. And any time that I feel any type of anguish or any type of difference, I go back and I'm like, why am I judging that person? There's something within myself that I haven't let go. Something within myself that I'm judging and when I'm able to let go of that judgment, I see people for the purity that they are. And sure. that's, that's where it all happened. And that's where it keeps going. And love keeps expanding because love will always keep expanding. And there's always room for love. <laughs> there is. It's, what a, what a, you know, I got to tell you, this was like a whole therapy appointment. So I'll have to send you a check <laughs> after this. Because I have always been a people uh -oh. pleaser as well. And and bringing that up that that's a, that that is a trauma response. It is. I went. Oh shoot! I'm going to have to go back and look at a lot of my life because because I agree. I don't think I got a lot of. I didn't get my needs met, and so I understand what you're saying. That's that's a rough. <laughs> that's a rough lesson to get, like in the middle of a podcast, <laughs> but a good yeah. one. Well, I mean, people pleasing can come from either not getting your needs met or coming from a hostile environment and wanting to make sure everything's in order and peace in order for your cortisol sure. levels and your nervous system to be relaxed. Sure. And so just say, okay, everything's cool. Everything's calm. I'm good. How are you? Okay. You okay? You sure you're good? Okay. Do you need anything? Like overly right. extending yourself. When you overly extend, you're depleting your energy. Yeah. You're not filling your own cup at that point and you end up exhausting right. yourself. Right. And actually, I was having a conversation with my wife earlier about how much I've needed to control everything in my life, just, you know, the small down to the minute kind of control over things. So once again, I'll, I'll uh, so I'll have to double. I'll put another zero at the end of the check. Unfortunately, <laughs> there's no number up the beginning. So it's now it's just two zeros, point zero zero. But, you know, I'll make a lot of money. Um I want there was something I want to follow up on because I had a conversation about this with somebody else, about, I, I believe the way we ended up putting it was leading with your trauma. So the, the person that you put forward is, is not what makes you happy, not what makes you great, what, what makes you um, an aspect of love, but rather what makes you the aspect of all the opposites, the, uh, the, an aspect of fear, an aspect of pain, an aspect of, of sadness, leading with your trauma um do you do you have you seen this in in you know your own conversations with people for that matter your own life um yeah let me stop have you seen have, do, you, do you understand what i mean by that meaning have i seen firsthand people leading their life with their trauma yeah leading yes leading Almost with always. their trauma i mean it's an unconscious mm -hmm. reaction 
And so people have adapted and survived that way because of their survival skills. Almost always someone's in some I type see. of traumatic mode, whether it's grief okay. or whether it's abuse or whether it's a single experience, whether it's PTSD. Uh, there's some kind of trauma that's leading people, I see. Not 100% of the time, but I can say almost always. All right. I mean, my... If I were to characterize your story, because you said you stopped doing that, and I feel that one of the real defining factors of... Hmm, how do I want to put this? Let me talk about it in terms of gender transition, because the conversation I had with my friend... I'm glad you are, because that's what's on my mind right now. And I know you're very okay. intuitive, because you did this on... We did this together um, <laughs> on my podcast. Where it's like we're mind-reading. You're an, in, you're an intuit. I would love to keep going. <laughs> so so the, the thought that... So when I was speaking with this friend of mine, he told me um, he sees people... I mean, this was sort of a, it was a collaboration. It does, it does make a difference who said what. The point is that we, we see people at the beginning of a gender transition and they go, everything that's bad about my life, dysphoria, uh, you know, the way our bodies look, the way, how much hair we have left, whatever, I'm speaking from a trans femme standpoint there. But many of the things that we talk about before we transition gender that it's it has to do with with how unhappy we are and that's we thought of that as sort of leading with this trauma because it, you need to be able to to I don't want to say flip the switch off but if you're going to transition at some point you have to go okay like this will not control me because I'm going to transition gender I'm going to take who I am I'm going to reclaim that and maybe I am a transgender woman who has to wear a wig because I don't have any hair. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm a transgender man who is, you know, 5'2", because I just didn't grow any bigger. But you have to take that back. You have to reclaim who you are, because if you don't, you always lead with your trauma. And I'll, we thought, anyway, that's, that you can't move forward, that you can't ultimately have a, what I would consider, anyway, a successful gender transition. That was what we talked about. <laughs> How did that sit? <laughs> it sits well. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Reclaim who we are. And so in this, what I'm feeling is, I always use the, the term reclaiming when I'm talking about the present moment. Because when you're in the present yeah. moment, you reclaim who you are at this moment. Yeah. In transitioning, one has to reclaim who they are. But what I have found, the, the in-depthness of the amount of love and appreciation and gratitude and acknowledgement that I have for this incredible body of mine is that I, I personally, this is, this is for me, for my, my, my specific journey here. I not only reclaim this current life, but I also reclaim who I was. Mm -hmm. Because a lot, what, and one thing I've noticed with a lot of people that have transitioned is they don't dead name me. Don't ever use my dead name or how dare you dead name me. I'm like, you know, I, I'm, but, but you I, spit that's a lot of right pain. Out. I see a lot yeah. of pain in that. And, yes. and, and I'm yes. very compassionate for the population that have so much hurt and pain towards who they were before. And right. I went through that. I went through it too. Hold on. You called me. What do I look like? Carol? Does this beard look like Carolina to you? You know, I mean, come on. I mean, I went through that as well. Right. But. In, and I'll say this within the last four years because it's only been within the last four years where I reclaimed who I was. And by doing that, and it, it all and it all stemmed from me going inward and loving myself and my body and realizing that it's always been the same consciousness. Hang on a minute. And becoming spiritual. Right. Hang on right. a minute. If I chose, if I chose to incarnate into this body at this time, at this specific time, what perfect timing for my soul to choose a time in this time period, this time frame, when yeah. people are able to transition. Ooh, Nothing is point. a coincidence. And so I knew before coming into this body that I was going to go through everything that I went through, that I was going to be a female, that I was going to see what it's like to be a female, that I was going to go through all the stages, that I was going to go through all, the, all this stuff with the surgeries, and that I was going to ultimately, sometime in my life, later in life, be a man. And, and in knowing that and feeling that to be true, 
I was able to reclaim who I was. I was able to see her for her beauty. There is no such thing as dead name. I still keep her alive. Her name was Carolina Amelia Martinez, and she was beautiful. And she was intelligent. And she got me a bachelor's degree. She got me a master's degree. She got me a doctor's right? degree. She got me to right. fight for my life. It's because yes. of her that Lino is here. Yes, yes. Oh, my gosh. And so I, in that, I reclaim her. I reclaim who she is and who she was and because she right. still exists within me. And right. I, I, sometimes I see it. And before when I was transitioning, I still see her. I don't want to see her anymore. You know what? Sometimes I see her and I love it. I'm like, hey, right, same. there you are. Yeah. The, you know, there's actually al along those lines, because I did the same sort of thing where I had to go. At some point, I've got a... I thought of it as letting go. So Robert was my dead name. So I thought of letting go of Robert, but I did the, the exact same thing you just described. I ended up going, no, 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 no. Like Robert went through graduate school. Robert went through, you know, everything. Robert found this wonderful woman who would marry him, you know, who wanted to have children with him. Robert had this amazing son who now teaches, you know, Amethysta so much <laughs> about existence. Yes. And uh, you you cannot, it never goes away. I wanted it to. I really did. I said, oh, gosh, you know, please don't, you know. But this concept of living in stealth is, I think it would be exhausting. I, I actually met somebody and, and she didn't pick up that I'm transgender immediately, which, you know, is a great compliment, right? I mean, it's great to get that. But sure. um she asked me at some point what it was, you know, what it was like being a little girl in Los Angeles. And I was like, <laughs> hmm. And I, you know, I mean, which is where I grew up. Sorry. I suppose that could have yeah. been more obvious, but I didn't say anything false, but I did have to recast things in ways that made me uncomfortable. Cause now I'm like, how am I going to remember all of these how am I going to remember all of this? And I actually connected with this person. I got her phone number, and then I called her the next morning and said, listen, I just want you to know I was assigned male at birth. You know, you asked me some questions, and I didn't tell you anything false, but I want you to know, you know, the, I, I can't get rid of that person, and I will never get rid of that person. And at this point, I don't want to because that person, you know, for 52 years got me here otherwise there'd be no amethysta exactly like you said there'd be no lino yeah. so that's just an exceptional point that i believe i don't want to say gets lost but i th i think when you can accept that is when you when you stop leading with your trauma i think that's that's exactly the point so well when one can come into acceptance that's when we stop suffering because yeah. it first hits our heart we've got pain right here and when you keep yeah. identifying with the pain here, it turns into suffering because you start creating stories and walls and barriers. Mm -hmm. But if you're able to accept it and let it go and just be at the moment, there's no suffering at that moment. And there's no more suffering anymore. Agreed. I have one more question for you. And yeah, I, I love this. It, it only came up. It only came up because you mentioned Friedrich Nietzsche. And there's something I actually have never asked anybody this. So, you know, it's going to take me a second to articulate it. But, yeah. but if, you were, if you were to go to somebody and say, hey, give me a Nietzsche quote. God is dead. That's one of them. <laughs> but the first one they're going to come up with is what doesn't kill me makes me stronger, depending on how you do the translation on that, right? Sure. What doesn't kill you, I think is what doesn't kill you, make you makes you stronger. But I think he was referring to himself, if I remember correctly. I disagree with that and i disagree because what doesn't kill you because i think what truly happens is what doesn't kill you reveals the strength that was already there mm -hmm. what do you think i love that because the strength is always existing it's always there it's just uh right beneath our awareness it's different from a muscle like a muscle, you can build strength. You stress it, it rebuilds, it's stronger, the way muscle fibers work. But I think our self, the strength was already there. We didn't know it yet. 
Well, the strength is already there because we're born with it. We're born yeah. with strength. We're born with courage. The minute we yes. come out of a womb, uh, or in this case, you know, an umbilical cord wrapped around my neck, right. um, out of my mother's, you know, C-section scar, however you come into this world, you've got no choice but to be brave. And that's courage. And that's the awareness that's already innate within us. Mm -hmm. Everything mm -hmm. else that we go through in life, whether whatever quotes Fred Friedrich Nietzsche went through to find himself is all their own internal suffering that they've had to peel back all the layers of suffering that they've gone through in their life. But right. if you go down back to the beginning of how we were brought into this world, we came in very strong and we came in very brave and we come alone. Not wholeheartedly. I mean, we've got <laughs> angels and, and spirit guides all around us, but as a human vessel here, on this planet, in this plane, where we come alone. Then, then let me ask you the question, because that was all I told you it was going to take me a while to, art to articulate this, sure. because the question was going to be, I am confident you've had people tell you, look at everything you went through and look at where you are today. You're so brave. Was that only bravery? It's interesting you say that. I rarely get anybody tell me that. I've 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 heard I've heard people say, Wow, you've gone through a lot or your story's incredible. But I rarely hear actually I don't even know the last time I heard someone say you're brave. Really? I haven't. Okay. I don't even I remember mean, when someone said that. Can I ask a different question then? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't have another one. That was it. Damn it. Um because I, I've gotten that a few times. People say, look at this, gosh, you know, it's so hard to transition gender. You're very brave. And I think to myself, it's not bravery because I wasn't, and this is going to come out sounding stilted, I wasn't not going to do it. Which sounds like more or less what you told me at the beginning of this. You know, yeah. you, you, you got to a point where you spent 10 years in a hospital and at some point you, you told yourself, I'm not, not going to do this. I'm just going to do it. Cause it, you, you had no choice. It was, you had to do it. And I've heard bravery defined as doing something. I, I forget exactly how it was doing something difficult, you know, when you really don't want to do it, essentially, when you're afraid to do it, when it's going to be difficult to do it. And all the, hardship that I ever endured and now to be here presenting as Amethysta, yeah, it was tough, but I wasn't not going to do it. That definitely just resonates. Who I am. That definitely okay. resonates. I can definitely see how the context of Brave comes from a hesitance or right. a, a perceived mm, maybe not. I'm not too right. sure, but I'm gonna do it anyway. But in this case is I'm going to do it regardless. There's no ifs, buts, what ifs. I'm just going for it. Yeah. And there's yes. what's brave about that other than I have to just do it. Yes. Yes. That's it. You know, I think I can, I can recollect the time when I, when, when I was having surgeries and perhaps maybe a nurse or doctor or someone said that's very brave of you to say I'm going to go for it. You know, or maybe it was a thought somewhere down the line. I may have heard that with surgeries, but I remember thinking the same thing. Well, it's not an option. It's not about being brave. It's just, it's yeah. not like I get a badge now, you know, a badge for my bravery right. and my courage. You know, it's not, it's, it's not, I'm not getting anything out of it other than more life. And it's, right. and, and when it's life or death and it, it's not an option, it's, it's like, um, I don't know, bravery is, is courageous maybe, but even courageous is kind of in the same context of bravery. It's, it, it is. Maybe there needs to be some other type of word to, to describe it. but I wonder, because it's not even, like I wouldn't even call it survival. You got more life, but it's not that you only survived. What you did was, was buy yourself time to become. I or, mean, and that's a weird way of putting it, but I think, go ahead, or... Or spiritually, I was just following my path. Yeah. Towards my yes. life's purpose. That's it. That's it. It's that's not survival. That's beating the path, you know, beating down the path so that you you walk it. There's no 
like you said, there's no ifs, ands, or buts. You just go, I'm walking this path. Get out of my way or don't, but I'm moving down this way. So, Something I want people to know as you're saying this um, is that, you know, the book that I wrote, A Little Less Fear, talks about all the suffering that I went through to come out on the other side. And it's very relentless because of how much that I did struggle and suffer to get to where I'm at today. From being, um, from it taking five years to get uh, Social Security disability, mm. from the court saying I, I, I'm educated enough to work, them not understanding. I mean, I went through years, five years in courts crying. There was so much struggle aside from, aside from it, mental, physical, emotional. What I want people to know is that you don't have to go through so much pain and struggle to be where I'm at today or a similar spot where I'm at today. Right. It does, you don't have to go through all this pain. You could find happiness and stay there at a very early time in your life. And so this is just my story, and it doesn't take struggle for everyone to get there. I don't want people to think, well, well I haven't struggled enough, so I guess I'll never get to where you're at, you know, because I've heard things like this. Well, I haven't yes. gone through what you've gone through, so that's okay. Everyone's story and everyone's life is their own story to tell and their own path and their own light. And they shine on their own path. And whether you've struggled a little bit or whether you've struggled a lot, there's no measure meter. There's no some type of pain o meter that's going to say, I've gone through more pain than you have. Let's see the meter, the pain meter here. Right. There's, there's no measurement. Pain is pain. It's a frequency. It's, it's a vibration. We've all been on that vibration before. Not one pain is greater than the other. And in and knowing that, we are able to know that we're all the same and that we all suffer the same and that we all cry the same and that we all laugh the same and love the same. It's a universal language, really. I cannot come up with a better way to, to, to end, the, uh, end this session. I mean, Thank you. <laughs> that was perfect. A great summary. So can, we, can you tell us... Um, where are we getting? And now I'm going to ask you another question. It was so dumb, but was, in 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 preparation oh. for shutting down that I just mentioned, uh. how, how do people find Dr. Lino Martinez? I'll, in everything you've done, everything that you've gone through, how do we find you? You can find me on my website at www.alittlelessfear.com. Everything is a little less fear. That's that's the handle. That's my handle on YouTube, a little less fear podcast. And Instagram is also Little Less Fear Podcast. The book is called A Little Less Fear. It's on Amazon, Amazon Kindle, Amazon Kindle Unlimited. Also, before we completely end, in the very beginning yeah. of the show, I just in case I offended anybody, I really apologize by saying I was a sexy B word. You know, oh. just, just I, I don't know. I don't know the sensitivity of listeners out there, but this was just me personal and something that I said about myself. I don't talk about women that way. I don't. That's just not my language. I, women are gorgeous. Women are beautiful. And there's no B word in front of that. That's just the personality type that she was prior to me. The Carolina was <laughs> that that was her coming through. I appreciated it, actually, because for what it's worth, I oh. like <laughs> And I'm, you know, I'm not speaking for everybody here. If anybody was offended, I apologize for saying, you know, I thought it was cool, but so maybe we should both just stop talking. I'll just let it go. Right? <laughs> but, um, Lino, thank you so much. I cannot express, you know, we had this, I felt we we had this connection when you and I talked on your podcast on a little less fear. Um, there's still that connection. It's like this, this silver thread that goes between your head and mine i'll, I'll stop that description because it was going nowhere but I, this connection it's going I, somewhere I'm, and you're right on with that there's a silver thread for sure i'm so grateful though for our connection thank you so much for likewise for, i love our connection you know, coming here thank you so, so much. thank you it's been a blessing so on that i am amethyst to herrick i've been talking with dr lino martinez on gender identity weekly about not just Muckle Wells syndrome, but existential psychology and many other fabulous topics about how to become a better person than you used to be. I don't know if that was a good way to end that, but <laughs> should I try that again? <laughs> I love it. I absolutely love it. <laughs> Do you want, I'm going to tell you, I won't even edit out that part. People are going to be like, oh shoot. Yeah, that's Amy, isn't it? So <laughs> leave it in there. I love it. <laughs> All right.